So any questions from the first half? Anything at all? All right. So we're going to move on into talking about renal neurology stuff. Remember, I had to update the slides because we just didn't have enough time. So make sure you have the, the right copy here. This one, this copy is pretty short, 28 slides, and then the part two, which is a little bit longer there. So uh, anyway, getting into talking about chronic kidney disease. Um, here, I'm just really trying to focus on introducing new medications that you might see being used for this. Um, certainly, there's a lot of information about acute kidney disease, uh, acute kidney injury, things like that. I don't have a whole ton of time, but if you have more questions about it, we can always talk later. But anyway, chronic kidney disease. So when we talk about chronic kidney disease, what does that mean? Chronic kidney disease. Chronic disease. <laughs> chronic. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. How is that evidence? How would you know if someone has chronic kidney disease or not? GFR. 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 How do you figure out what their GFR is? Creatinine clearance, right? Absolutely. So you calculate with the creatinine clearances. Just because someone has a high creatinine does not necessarily mean they have chronic kidney disease, but usually uh, it does follow along with that. So a lot of times you look at things like their, their creatinine clearance uh, and kind of give you an idea of what their stage of chronic kidney disease is, right? So again, this is for more longstanding. This is not like you get septic and then all of a sudden you have an acute decrease in kidney function. This is more longstanding. I want to talk about the metabolic complications of longstanding kidney disease because we know the kidneys are super important for things like blood pressure control. We know they're important for regulating electrolytes, et cetera. So I want to kind of focus on a lot of the, these complications thereof and the medications we use to treat that, right? Uh, have you covered chronic kidney disease already? Yes. Good, fantastic. You guys are all experts. You can teach me all this stuff. No, no, no not so much. Not that part. I guess you weren't taught that well. Oh, oh my goodness. I'm going to have to let them know you think that. Anyway, so typically when you're thinking of a normal creatinine clearance, you're typically thinking of something over 90, over 100. It's pretty normal creatinine clearance. As you start to get lower and lower, you're going to find that, you know, ESRD or the end stage renal disease is usually creatinine clearance less than 15. This is where you're starting to think about things like dialysis, right? And so um, how does this affect drugs? Increased concentrations, they can't clear them as well. So this can be a big deal for a lot of different medications. And so you have to look at this stuff whenever you're dosing your drugs for these patients, right? And again, question is, is like, okay, well, you know, I have their creatinine clearance that we calculated, but this is from labs that were done two years ago. It may not be the same, right? You have to adjust for these things as time goes on. I cannot tell you how many patients I've seen, I got consulted on at the poison center where I said, oh, well, this lady was on, you know, she was on digoxin and she was on this dose for years and years and years. And then no one ever went back and readjusted it. No one ever went back and looked to see like, well, what's her renal function now? Now all of a sudden her level comes back and it's four or five. She's bradycardic, she's hypotensive. And now we got to treat it, right? Um, so you need to make sure you're kind of adjusting for these things as time goes on, look for it, right? Because otherwise uh, you're going to look pretty silly if you uh, don't adjust and your patient has a bad outcome, right? Anyway, so what are some of the common reasons for chronic kidney disease? Anyone know? Diabetes and hypertension, diabetes and hypertension are probably the biggest things, right? Why diabetes? The, the blood the yeah, the nephropathy that occurs there, right? The neuropathy is where you get the tingling and whatnot, but the nephropathy, I always get that confused too, so don't feel bad. Uh, the nephropathy is a big thing. So diabetes is a big one. Hypertension, usually those two go hand in hand anyway. You have other things like glomerulonephritis, things like that could be playing a role here as well. And obviously things that are going to be helping to progress this along are going to be obviously these metabolic um, uh, issues here, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera. Proteinuria as well, just kind of shredding that glomerulus, kind of forcing all the protein, all the sugar through, tends to wear it down over time. So um, now we know that the, the pathophys of it is going to be occurring through several different pathways here. So it can include things like uh, loss of the actual nephron mass itself. Uh, you can find that the actual glomerular capillary hypertension as that pressure builds up. And again, how can I fix that pressure? By lowering, well, lowering the blood pressure right, is a big thing. What kind of drugs can I do to lower that? ACE inhibitors. inhibitors are a big one, right? Because I can decrease that, that efferent pathway, that efferent arterial, right? But what does that do to kidney function acutely? Like a decrease, right? Remember, these patients are dependent on having that pressure there. So if you introduce something like an ACE inhibitor, guess what? It goes down pretty precipitously in the short term. Again, that's, again think about these things when we're going back through and being like, okay, oh, yeah, that's why you talked about that. That's why this is a big problem for patients with chronic kidney disease because they need that pressure there. Otherwise, their GFR does go down pretty significantly, right? These are things you have to consider. So looking at one of the, the kind of the metabolic complications of chronic kidney disease, the big one's anemia. Why do you get anemic with chronic kidney disease? Right, the poetins produce in the kidneys. So if you have decreased kidney function, that includes production of hormones, things like erythropoietin. And so you can find that um, these patients here, they're going to have a normal chromic normocytic anemia because their issue is not with the production of the red blood cells. Their issue is with the actual stimulation of the production thereof, right? Um, now, however, these patients are usually going to be uh, at risk for iron deficiency. It's a common thing, mainly because they may have things like decreased GI uptake. They may have issues where they have a lot of blood testing. Imagine you're going to go in for dialysis, get labs in all the time, get hooked up to this dialysis 
electrolysis machine. They take some blood. We try to give as much blood back as we can, but you're going to lose a lot of those red blood cells. You're going to lose iron over time. And so these are things you have to consider, right? And so oftentimes when you have this increased need for producing red blood cells, you typically have an increased need for iron. So one of the things you're going to find here is that whenever you give erythropoietin or anything to stimulate red blood cell production, what do you need to give with it? Iron. You have to give iron along with it. Otherwise, you're going to just be shooting yourself in the foot because if they don't have iron to produce hemoglobin, you can give them EPO all day long. It's not going to do anything, right? So uh, other things you can find that are common problems here are going to be mineral and bone disorders, okay? So uh, when I talk about mineral and bones, we're mainly focusing on what two elements here? Calcium and phosphorus, right? So these are going to be two things that get dysregulated here. We're going to find that PTH is playing a big role here. What does PTH normally do? It tries to increase calcium, right? It tries to increase calcium levels by getting it from where? From the gut also, from the bone, right? So we're going to see those osteoporotic sort of complications that can happen here as well, right? Um, we're going to find that calcium and phosphorus, they really like each other and they get in really high concentrations. They love to bind one another up. This is a big concern not only in patients with chronic kidney disease, but also if you think about it from the drug preparation standpoint, we have certain things when we're giving things like total parental nutrition, we kind of make sure we don't have too much calcium or phosphorus, otherwise it precipitates, comes out of solution that can cause problems in the patient, uh, cause an embolus, can block a line off, you know, so that's a big thing that happens and we'll talk more about that. Also, vitamin D, where is vitamin D? produced in the kidney liver and skin okay so the skin's good so you have a nice sun exposure i may not have as so much as some of you guys but um you get some sun exposure and you produce vitamin d is that the active form no, no. where does that have to get activated okay. the liver first and then yeah. the kidneys a bad kidneys guess what i can produce all those stuff i want in the, in the liver it doesn't do me any good so vitamin d synthesis is usually down what does that do for my calcium levels decreases it because I can't reabsorb it from the, or I can't get it from the GI tract, right? So again, you're going to find that this thing tends to have a pretty sick cycle here where they're going to kind of be precipitating worsened effects um, because the kidney's not working. It's going to make the kidneys work worse and et cetera, right? And so they develop what we call this renal osteodystrophy that happens here. I'm going to go into more detail on that in a few minutes, but we're going to talk about ways to try to interrupt this process by helping to reestablish how we're uh, handling phosphorus and calcium for these patients. So looking at this, okay, we have decreased renal function. What does that kind of immediately result in? Well, we can't process our electrolytes effectively. And one of the big things you're going to find, you have increased phosphate levels. Phosphate, as I mentioned, really loves calcium. So it's going to try to bind that up. So your calcium levels then drop because if it's out of solution, your body can't detect it. And it says, okay, well, I have decreased calcium levels. So what does the body do to respond to that? PTH is going to go up, right? Your parathyroid say, hey, we don't have enough calcium here. Let's try to stimulate some new calcium, right? So it's going to be doing what? Grab it from the bone, it's one place. Grab it from the gut. It'll do what in the kidneys? Increase reabsorption of calcium, right? Because you'll filter it, but you want to increase reabsorption there. And then also stimulates what else? Vitamin D synthesis, right? So it's trying to do all these things because the vitamin D also plays a big role in trying to get calcium from the gut, tries to help it reabsorb from the, um, from the, the kidneys, uh, all these things, right? So increased PTH means you're going to have increased calcium and phosphate reabsorption. You can't get one without the other, unfortunately. So you're going to have more phosphate binding up that calcium there as well. And so also we're going to see more calcium mobilization from the bone, which again, this is usually older patients we're seeing this in who may be at risk for osteoporosis anyway. Uh, and then you're going to find they also have this decreased activation of vitamin D. So again, even though PTH is uh, secrete, uh, being secreted and it's kind of trying to stimulate vitamin D production, the kidneys are bad. They're not going to be able to activate that vitamin D. And so again, vitamin D normally is one of those parts of the negative feedback loop, not as only increased calcium is part of the negative feedback loop of vitamin D is as well. If you lose that, then the PTH is said, okay, well, we need even more PTH, right? So you see it's kind of the sixth cycle that happens here. So you get this hyperplasia of the parathyroid, you end up developing this osteitis fibrosis cystica, or basically this high bone turnover, where it's trying to take up a bunch of calcium out of the bone, but you're not necessarily laying it back down at the same rate there. Uh, and this at least Austin Malaysia. So you can see how you know, these chronic metabolic complications, in addition to whatever else is going on with the patient, this is just purely from the kidney aspect as well. So our management here, what we'd like to do is hopefully prevent progression of disease, right? Hopefully preserve whatever kidney function we have and then try to minimize some of the severity of those metabolic complications we talked about here, right? We'd like to limit the need for things like hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, or renal transplant if we can, because what's the problem with using things like hemodialysis or uh, <laughs> Time consuming. If I have to go into the the infusion center or my dialysis center, have four hours of dialysis done three times a week, it's 12 hours out of your whole week, right? Everyone needs that time. What else? Yeah, I mean, the heart may be under a ton of stress from other, you know, their hypertension and other things like that for sure. What else?
risk of infection. Oftentimes they need a dialysis catheter that's placed there in order to make sure that they can get that hooked up. You don't want to, um, you know, depending on the type of dialysis and everything, it can uh, make a difference, but infection's a big deal. Peritoneal dialysis get, frequently get infected as well. So we had to end up giving antibiotics to um, in the peritoneal space. So there's lots of different issues there. And then obviously if we can address the primary issues, the diabetes, get that under control, hopefully it'll prevent further progression in, in, from the kidney standpoint, right? So those are all big things we want to focus on. So looking at non-pharmacologic therapy, what can we do? Uh, one thing is to try to limit their protein intake, right? A lot of patients tend to have higher protein levels, and again, that protein causes proteinuria, which again, further kind of progresses damage done to the glomerulus. Um, so things like limiting protein, like 0.8 grams per kilo per day. Now, oftentimes these patients may have other nutritional problems. So they probably need their protein. Older patients typically do what with their muscle mass? They, yeah, they end up losing muscle mass over time. So they still need protein, but you got to make sure you don't give them too much protein. So it's kind of a, a difficult thing to, to work with there. Also limit their sodium intake. These patients probably have hypertension. It's kind of related to their sodium anyway. So it's going to be able to help out with that as well. Now, obviously, smoking cessation is a big thing. Exercise, obviously, right? So looking at the diabetes. So what do we need to give for diabetic patients to help preserve that kidney function? ACE inhibitors. If you have a diabetic patient, they need to be on an ACE inhibitor for a kidney protection or the nephro protection there. And so we see either ACE or ARB, doesn't really matter which one, um, helps prevent further progression of that CKD. So if you can get it on board early, it's always going to be a good thing, right? And now, however, um, you know, at what point do you start to see actual kind of an odd, odd way to ask it. So again, you have two kidneys, right? They have a lot of reserve function, right? You actually don't notice that chronic kidney disease, so you already lose a significant portion of that kidney function, right? So again, it's not something that's really evident until you've already done a lot of damage. So if you can start this earlier, that's going to be protective for them for a much longer period of time, which is good. Other things to think about, though, um, you know, we will look at this and we're going to look at um, with kidney function, what does normally your potassium do? If I have poor kidney function, they can't process electrolytes well, usually goes up, right? So you usually see hyperkalemia in patients with chronic kidney disease. What does the ACE inhibitor do to your potassium? Hyperkalemia. Also causes that, right? So again, you have to watch for that. You have to make sure you're not going to be worsening that and causing an arrhythmia due to that, right? Um, and another thing to look at with diabetic patients, we'll talk about this in the endocrinology section next semester, but a common drug, a lot of those patients are on called metformin. It's a very good drug for diabetics. It helps to, um, the body to utilize their, their insulin and their glucose more effectively. Um, you cannot use this in patients with really severe chronic kidney disease. If their GFR is less than 30, if they have a certain creatinine, um, you're gonna find that this will lead to things like lactic, acid, lactic acidosis. I've seen a few patients die from that. Um, so you have to be really careful with that drug. Again, we'll talk about that much more when we get into, into uh, next semester. Now for the hypertension, what should their goal be? Well, try to get their blood pressure down to, and again, the goals are pretty much similar for, for any patient now, nowadays, but uh, try to get them under 140 over 90 and get them down a little bit lower, down closer to normal. That's great. Uh, however, remember, for these really chronically hypertensive patients, that's probably their normals. They have to be really careful and make sure you need to maybe do this over a slower time period um, to try to help them re-regulate things like their baroreceptors and, and whatnot. So, um, what if someone already has kind of low blood pressure, but they have diabetes? Would you still want to put them on a low-dose ACE inhibitor just to protect their kidney function? That would be a rare patient um, that you like would see. Like my mom, like my mm -hmm. mom, she has, she has diabetes, mm -hmm. but she has like, her blood pressure is like 110 over 70. I mean, it's not low, low, but yeah. it's like you know, she definitely doesn't have hypertension. So think about that. So from a patient with the low blood pressure or, you know, good blood pressure, normal, good blood pressure, normal, good blood pressure um, is their renin angiotensin system really that ramped up in the first place? Probably not, right? So again, if I don't have a ton of angiotensin II that's really being produced, giving that low-dose ACE inhibitor, is that really going to cause that much of a difference? Probably not, right? So again, you may find by starting low dose, you may not really have that much of a difference in our blood pressure. However, you may still get some of those benefits from the nephro protection, right? But again, her main problem probably isn't that her high blood pressure is helping to, uh, you know, rapidly deteriorate that glomerulus yeah. that you'd expect. So maybe that's less of an important thing there. But it's probably still good to have it on board anyway, just from yeah, other. About, like, sugar, you know, kind mm -hmm. of yeah, for a patient like that, I would say, yeah, the sugar under control, that's going to be probably the most beneficial thing versus yeah. someone who's like super hypertensive and diabetic. Like th that's the kind of person where ACE inhibitor is going to be much more useful probably from that standpoint, right? Because again, a lot of times these patients who are diabetic, oftentimes are what? Overweight, they're hypertensive, hyperlipidemia, they have all these other metabolic complications yeah. as well, right? Um, so again, it depends. Every patient's a snowflake, right? Everyone's a little different, but um, that's the thing I would consider for those patients, right? Okay, thank you. Anywho.
Again, don't say snowflake is a derogatory term. It just means everyone's a little different. Everyone reacts a little differently. <laughs> but by seeing a million different patients that present a million different ways, you kind of get in a feel for like, okay, what are the usual things? Like, okay, this type of patient I see is kind of like this. It's kind of like these other patients I dealt with. I'm going to do this instead, right? Yeah. And so by seeing a lot of the same thing over and over again, you get a good feel for it. That's what rotations is for. That's what you're going to find when you graduate and get on your first job. You're going to be like, I got no idea what I'm doing. But six months in, a year in, you're like, oh yeah, I've seen this kind of patient a million times. I know exactly what to do, right? You can gain that confidence very quickly. Anyway, um, yeah, so for diabetes, ACE inhibitor or ARB need to be first line for those patients there. Again, if they have hypertension, great drug for them. If they have CHF, great drug for them. No problem there. Um, Diazides probably are not going to be sufficient in a lot of those cases there, and they don't really have the same nephroprotective effects as you see with the ACE inhibitor, okay? And again, managed BP as with other, uh, as there are other indications really dictate, right? If they have an MI, what do they need to be on? Beta blocker, Beta blocker ACE inhibitor. Yeah. Statin, right? So again, all these other things to help manage their conditions oftentimes are going to help out with the chronic dis uh, kidney disease aspects of it, right? There's a lot of double duty that these drugs will end up playing there, which is good. Now with anemia of chronic kidney disease, wh why do I care about anemia here? I got to be able to deliver oxygen to the tissues, right? So I need to make sure that I have enough hemoglobin that can uh, make that happen there. So by increasing their oxygen carrying, uh, carrying capacity, that's going to help with their exercise tolerance. It's going to help them perfusing the body there. And this will help to decrease any you know, things like fatigue and all the other things that come along with that, that chronic anemia there. Hopefully, it'll also decrease the need for transfusions, right? So again, if you come in, you're checking your patient for dialysis and they come in, their hemoglobin's like eight. You may think, okay, well, do I need to give them a transfusion? Oftentimes, you can bypass that by giving them that stimulation to produce uh, new red blood cells by uh, giving them the EPO that they cannot produce themselves, okay? Now, again, we're going to be using what we call erythropoiesis stimulating agents, so the ESA, that's what that's referring to, uh, and then iron supplementation as well, okay? Not just oral iron supplementation, there's also some IV forms we'll talk about in a second here. And again, the hemoglobin is going to be the main thing you're monitoring for, okay? So the target hemoglobin, should you shoot for a normal? Why not? too much for them, right? So what they find is, is if you try to shoot for a normal hemoglobin for those patients, they tend to have this viscosity issue that happens here. The blood tends to sludge up in the vessels, and what can that lead to? Stroke, right? Strokes is a big thing. So what they find is that, you, and it's a black box warning, they say do not shoot for to get to normal hemoglobin levels because you will cause a stroke in that patient. They'll do that just that viscous blood that's kind of sludging up the works. And so typically when you have these chronic kidney disease patients, um, we'll end up starting an ESA when their hemoglobin is around, say, 9 to 10 or so. And then we'll discontinue it once they get above a certain level. So, for instance, if a, you have a renal replacement therapy patient or someone who is on dialysis, we'll stop it above 11. Okay. Thinking we know those patients are going to be kind of getting, losing blood anyway, just due to the natural uh, process of getting dialysis frequently. But if you were to say, try to keep them above 13, say, hey, let me get them up to a normal level, they do see increased mortality. And that's a black box warning. So you don't, you don't want to be on the hook for, for doing something like that. Now, again, you may find that you can give all the EPO all day long, but the hemoglobin is not rising. A lot of it has to do with the fact that if they don't have good iron supplementation, it's not going to do you any good. You just give them a very expensive drug for no really good benefit. A um, couple agents we have include epoetin alpha. So if you ever hear me say EPO or EPO, this is kind of what we're referring to, is epoetin alpha. There's darbipoetin, which is called Aranesp. Uh, and again, this is the black box warnings that increase risk of death, MI, stroke, VTE, all due to the fact that they're driving up their hemoglobin too much. Uh, that's an issue there. Some small risk of increase for certain types of cancers, but that's pretty rare. Uh, and you'll find that the dosing can depend on um, kind of what's going on with the patient. Some have a long half-life, like Aranesp, you have to give less frequently. Um, oftentimes, they'll get EPO and they're going in for their dialysis anyway because they're there. You know, they have nurses that can administer the drug there, all of that. Um, and obviously, be aware of things like hypertension, vascular access thrombosis, all this sort of thing. Now, if you think about it, this kind of makes sense when you're going back to, um, if you think about athletes who were abusing EPO, what happened to them? They took too much, they had too much EPO, they're producing too much hemoglobin, and what happened? They're exercising, they're on the, they're on the Tour de France, and they're getting dehydrated because they're sweating a whole bunch, and what happens? Stroke out and they die, right? So again, it kind of goes back to thinking about that. Remember, if you're dehydrated, your blood is going to be more viscous, right? Because they have all the same red blood cells there, but less fluid for them to float around in, so you can see why that would happen there. Okay, same thing happens for our dialysis patients. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, with the iron status, you want to be able to maintain adequate intakes of both iron, B12, folate, because again, we need all of that for help with red blood cell production. Oftentimes, these can be diminished in patients who are on chronic renal replacement therapy. And be aware that just oral intake of iron may not be sufficient for a lot of these patients here, right? Um, they may have impaired absorption uh, of that iron, maybe only 10% or so, okay? And so there's a few different versions that are out there. Uh, there. I mean, there's a million different salts of iron. The common ones you're going to run into include things like ferrous sulfate, ferrous gluconate, ferrous humorate. Now, be aware when you're looking at these products here and you're looking at your dosing, Dose everything in elemental iron. 
Okay, so there's a difference between the elemental iron content of these drugs and the actual salt content. So as an example, ferrous, uh, ferrous sulfate is the most common one you're going to run into. Normally comes in a tablet of 325 milligrams. 325 milligrams of ferrous sulfate. That is not the same as the elemental iron content. And when you actually get down to it, it's 65 milligrams of elemental iron. So you need to make sure, and a lot of products are now starting to be more upfront about that, but just when you're looking at the dosing, looking at the products, make sure you're reading specifically what they're referring to. You want to make sure that you're dosing based on the elemental iron content. Otherwise, you may not give enough because you're overestimating. You say, oh, I'm giving 325 elemental iron. You're really not. You're only giving them 325 of the salt form, right? Uh, so something to think about. What kind of side effects do I expect to see from oral iron administration? Constipation. Constipation is a big one. Uh, hmm? Yeah, potentially. Yeah, it can be rough on the, on the GI tract. Esophagus specifically. What color does it turn your stool? Dark, dark. Black. black. It turns it black, right? So again, when you see black stool, what do you think? Bleed. Think GI bleed, right? Patients could be at risk for bleeding, right? You see blood dyscrasias like thrombocytopenia with dialysis patients. So again, you want to warn them about that. that hey, just if you see this black stool, don't be too freaked out. That's normal. Right? That's just the iron. Um, what happens if I were to give this with, say, other medications potentially? To bind it up, right? So now you're starting to think about, okay, well, I got to separate these drugs out and make sure they don't bind one another up. You know, if they're on antibiotics, you can bind a fluoroquinolones. These are all things you have to consider. And again, if this patient, you know, if you have someone who's chronic kidney disease, who has a previous MI, they're already on a statin, they're on a beta blocker, they're on an ACE inhibitor, they may be on spironolactone, if they have CHF along with it, and they might be on iron, they might be on all these different drugs. And you start to see how all these things are going to start to kind of combine on one another. You need to make sure you're trying to time these things out. And so it can be very difficult when the patient's busy, they got their own life to lead, they may not want to spend their whole day thinking about when I'm taking all these medications there, right? Um, there's a lot of IV preparations, which are nice because they will have 100% bioavailability. Yes, ma'am. How much time should you last between taking your medication and Typically, I'll do either take the other medication, say like an hour before, or I'd say two or three hours after the iron, right? So if I give it before, those will kind of get through, get absorbed, and then the iron can come after. Or if I were to give the iron first, I probably want to wait two or three hours. Mm -hmm. And again, there's no hard and fast rules. It's good to kind of a decent rule of thumb there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do we have things like iron dextran, sodium ferrogluconate, iron sucrose, uh, and spheromoxitol? Um, some of them, they all carry some risk of uh, anaphylactoid, anaphylactic reactions. So you do want to be aware of that. They can have an allergic sort of reaction to these. Um, but again, 100% bioavailability. The iron can be used immediately to help start to produce some of that new hemoglobin, which is nice. Okay, as I mentioned, the, the adverse effects here from the GI standpoint, um, this is going to be more of the oral iron preparation. So again, constipation, abdominal cramping, that's all going to be very common. You're going to see with that. You may need to kind of play around with which salt, what kind of dose you're going to be administering to the patient, maybe dividing up the dose maybe twice a day to see what's really tolerable by them, right? And as I mentioned, the IV formulations, the, the biggest thing is just allergic reactions. In some cases, you may see things like arthralgias, arthritis associated with that as well. Okay, so again, if we can, if you can get away using oral iron preparation, that's awesome, right? And you're going to be monitoring the hemoglobin concentrations to see how they're responding to that. If it's still not going to be effective, then you may need to switch over and use IV, especially for patients who are on chronic renal replacement therapy like dialysis. Um, and then you're going to be monitoring every three months or so their iron status, especially while they're on ESA therapy, uh, to make sure they're going to be kind of nice and well repleted to make sure that uh, the EPO has something to work with, right? Uh, okay. So again, our treatment goals, getting into the bone and mineral category here, there's going to be some other new drugs we'll talk about. Um, we want to try to help reestablish normal processing for both vitamin D, calcium, and phosphorus here, okay? Um, we know that by helping to reestablish normal kind of uh, processes here is going to help to decrease some of the bone manifestations, cardiovascular issues that pop up here. Again, that calcium and phosphorus, when they bind up together, they can kind of deposit everywhere. That can cause all kinds of problems. And so by helping to fix this, you decrease morbidity and mortality associated with that. And typically what we shoot for is we have what we call the calcium phosphorus product. When you multiply these two together, we like to keep a value less than 55. Okay. So again, if your patient has a you know calcium of say 12 or 13 and their phosphorus is high, multiply those two together. If it's higher than 55, they probably need to do something about that. It's too high for those patients. And you may want to turn the PTH levels as well. So what we can do is one, try to limit our dietary phosphate intake. And so this helps to really, um, this is really the first thing you can do for hyperphosphatemia, try to decrease the amount they're actually intaking through the diet. Um, so again, 800 to 1,000 milligrams a day. That's fine. Where do you get most of your phosphate from though? Protein. Protein is a big place where you get a lot of phosphate from, right? Um, if you think about muscles, what makes muscles work? Calcium. Calcium is a big one. What else? ATP. That's the main energy source. Adenosine tri. 
Phosphate, there you go, right? So you see where all that phosphate's coming from. So, um, you know, meat can be a big one. So we already said we want to make sure they get adequate protein intake, but not too much protein. This is another reason for that, because we want to get them to have too much phosphate in there. I think like sodas and stuff have a lot of phosphate too. Uh, if you talk to a dietitian, they can tell you uh, probably a whole list of foods uh, that fall into that category. But anyway, I think peanut butter, uh, dairy products, you know, things like that, all have high phosphate levels, right? Um, and again, depending on the type of patient, you know, dialysis patients may even have higher protein requirements because there's a hypermetabolic sort of state there. Um, so this is the case where it can be very difficult to get enough protein in while trying to limit that phosphate. Okay. Um, other patients that may require things like parathyroidectomies, I'm not going to get too much into that, but typically they've not responded to any of their pharmacologic therapy. That's what you can do potentially. And dialysis is not going to be good enough to pull off that phosphate. The calcium um, dialysis is really good for correcting things like sodium, uh, uh, potassium, um, but it's not really good for calcium and phosphorus, unfortunately. So what can I do? Well, I can also give a phosphate binder. I can give things in the GI tract to actually bind up the phosphate. However, if they're binding a phosphate, what else do you think they bind up? Other drugs, potentially, right? So you're going to find that, again, this is going to be another big group of interacting medications there. It might bind up our iron, potentially, right? So this is where we're going to see things like calcium carbonate. Where do we talk about calcium carbonate recently? Antacid, right? So again, it's a very common one. It's probably the most uh, common one people will be on first because it's cheap, it's easy, it's effective, uh, easy to find. And then we're going to have a few other ones, things like calcium acetate, which is called FOSLO. Makes sense based off the brand name, what it's going to be doing there. Um, Savella carbonate, lanthanum carbonate, and then we have aluminum hydroxide. And we talked about aluminum hydroxide. What do we use that for? As an antacid, right? What did it cause? Constipation, diarrhea. Or magnesium hydroxide caused diarrhea. Aluminum causes constipation, yeah. So this would be one we'll talk about a little bit. This one's used less commonly nowadays, and we'll talk about why in a minute here. But um, again, calcium-based ones are going to be good. But what do we say about their calcium levels? Their calcium levels are probably already high to begin with. So again, if they're hypercalcemic, this may not be the best option here. You may want to give them something that's going to be non-calcium-based, right? So again, these are all things to kind of consider here. Yes? I'm sorry. I thought they, they, I thought they had hypocalcemia depends okay. it depends on where they're at in the state there right so imagine so their phosphate levels are going up that can then drive their calcium levels down because it's binding it up right so you could have early on and you have this hypocalcemia that occurs there but then your parathyroids is going to be kicking into high hyperdrive right and then so you're going to find that not only you're not processing it from the kidneys but you're also liberating it from the bones and all that um, so you can end up seeing that uh, later on you could have a very high calcium phosphate product so you're right it depends on where, kind of where you're at in the staging. So would you want to give that to them when they're on the hypo kind of calcium? Yeah, I can give them calcium carbonate. That'd be no problem, right? Because, again, they probably need that calcium. But then when they're getting further along and they're more progressive, then you may find that their calcium levels are high to begin with. This may not be a good option. So would that help with the osteitis cystica? Uh, potentially. But the biggest thing to do with that is to try to um, suppress the PTH levels. Because, again, the PTH is the main driver there for trying to liberate that calcium. From wouldn't be like stimulated you would think so right that's one factor of it but then also they can't produce vitamin d vitamin d is also another part of that negative feedback loop so we're gonna see there's other drugs actually help to bypass that as well which we'll get to in just a few minutes thank you for that segue that's great <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, right, so again, um, calcium-based agents are good in early CKD, as you mentioned, um, when they're hypocalcemic, right? That's when they're likely hypocalcemic because their high phosphate is binding up that calcium there, which is good. Um, calcium carbonate uh, is pretty good. You would give it before meals because, again, it's more soluble in an acidic medium. That's when you're producing a lot of those GI acids anyway, which is good. Um, and then we have other things. We have things like Savellamer, which is going to be non-absorbable, um, but actually can have uh, some, some effects here where it's actually good from a hyperlipidemia standpoint. actually lowers, H, uh, lowers LDL raises of HDL. Um, and I will tell you that the alumina-based products are not used so much frequently anymore. Aluminum, what you find is these patients will absorb it and not be able to get rid of it very well. And what they actually found was that they actually developed neurotoxicity seen from this. So this is going to be more relegated to patients who are kind of refractory to other products. Um, they can use this for maybe the short term, but you do worry about neurotoxicity developing. One of the things you'll see with patients who are uremic from their kidney disease, what can happen to their mental status? And they get a little loopy, right? So again, you don't know, is it the aluminum I'm giving them? Is that on top of that? Is it, you know, just because they have dementia is developing because they're older? So again, a lot of factors going on here. Patients can get very, very complicated from this standpoint. So looking at the phosphate binders, typically you're going to find mostly just GI side effects from this, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, et cetera. Uh, hypercalcemia can be seen here. Again, if that's only if I'm using a calcium-based product, right? So again, they can, they can absorb some of that. And I mentioned the aluminum toxicity. You want to be careful uh, from that standpoint. Um, and then big drug food, uh, drug drug interactions here. The calcium salts are going to be binding up a lot of things like iron, fluoroquinolones. You need to do an hour before 
or three hours after other agents, okay? So again, give the other drugs an hour before or three hours after. That way you kind of separate them out. And again, three hours, that's a long period of time, right? So again, you're trying to think about when I'm taking medications, you know, what your daily routine's kind of like, if people may still be working, it can be very complicated from that standpoint. Now, vitamin D, we mentioned that uh, ergo and cholecalciferol are the most common forms you're going to either be seeing in, a, in medicinal products. You can buy over the counter as a vitamin um, and find these coming in from your diet. Obviously, we produce some from sun exposure as well. Um, again, they need to be converted both in the liver and then into the kidneys. If you got bad kidneys, it doesn't matter how much precursor you have, it's not going to do you any good. So what we can do is either uh, bypass this whole process by giving the active form already. This is where we have calcitriol, which is a 125 hydroxy vitamin D, so that's the active form, it's going to be working directly to suppress PTH and stimulates calcium absorption, because again, vitamin D normally helps with getting calcium levels up, so if they're hypocalcemic, it's going to be useful from that standpoint. Um, however, be careful, because it could lead to more hypercalcemia and hyperphosphatemia, okay? This is going to help to reabsorb that stimulation, from, or, uh, increase uh, reabsorption from the kidneys and from the GI tract. Okay, so it's good to get the PTH levels down, but it's also going to help to worsen the hypercalcemia, hyperphosphatemia potentially. Okay, so how do I get around that? It could be uh, some issues there. Well, basically what I can do is give something called paracalcitol. This will actually activate the PTH receptors, but doesn't increase the, P, uh, the phosphate and the calcium reabsorption. So by that way, I can help to inhibit that feedback loop by stimulating PTH receptors, but it doesn't actually work like vitamin D normally does. It only it kind of uh, tricks the parathyroids into thinking, hey, we have enough vitamin D around. I don't need to stimulate any further release of calcium from the bone or from the GI tract, et cetera, right? That's why we're kind of tricking things. Again, if possible, I'd always like to give just the normal form of vitamin D that the patient can produce themselves, right? It's a little bit cheaper that way. Uh, but again, if you need to get around that, that's where calcitriol is going to be coming into play. And there's one called uh, Sinicalcid or Sensipar. This actually will sensitize the PTH receptors, so it'll be more responsive to the calcium that's already there in the blood, and will help to produce PTH levels that way. Okay. So those are the main things to focus on for chronic kidney disease, at least as far as the complications thereof and the ways we're going to manage that. Um, and obviously, we talked about a lot of drugs already that can affect kidney function. So for instance, like NSAIDs, what is it going to do? Yeah, they're going to cause afferent constriction, right? Because they would decrease prostaglandin synthesis, right? Um, how might, say, for instance, a loop diuretic affect kidney function? You think, oh, it should increase it, right? Because you're peeing more. Is that truly the case? Not necessarily, right? You're just inhibiting reabsorption of water from the loop of Henle, right? That's all the stuff you've already filtered. In fact, you can actually cause a hypovolemia because you're losing fluid. And what does that do to kidney function? It's going to decrease it, right? You call that a pre-renal kidney dysfunction when you're hypovolemic, right? Because you can't shuttle enough fluids there to the kidneys because your body's trying to perfuse the head and the heart, right? Um, so again, other little things you can think about from an acute ki uh, kidney standpoint, we don't really have time to cover it here, but from the chronic standpoint, focus on the complications and how we're going to be able to manage that, okay? Any questions from that standpoint? Okay, so we focused on the, uh, the renal side of things. Now we're going to be focusing more on the urology side of things, okay? So the first thing we're going to talk about is erectile dysfunction. So what is erectile dysfunction? Having an issue with getting yeah, either getting the erection in the first place or uh, sustaining the erection, right? So that way you can actually uh, you know, kind, of, kind of complete the deed, so to speak. Um, you know, typically this is going to be for a period of time, say like three months or so. It's not just going to be with one isolated case here. Um, and this is very different from things like issues with libido, ejaculatory disorders, infertility. This is mainly just with the actual act of developing and, and maintaining the erection itself. Um, so keep in mind, when we're talking about things like, uh, for instance, SSRIs or antidepressant medications affecting, um, you know, sexual dysfunction or causing sexual dysfunction, like this is not really going to be addressing that. This is specifically just with the mechanics of getting, actually the erection itself. Um, again, we'll, this is kind of where we get to kind of focus on the guys for right now. And then next semester when we go OB guy, and then we get to focus on the ladies there. Um, guess what? You guys give it a lot more attention than, than the guys do. It's just how it is. So anyway, so the actual physiology itself, basically what you're going to find is that within the penis, there is pretty uh, balanced flow from both the arterial and the venous side of things, right? That's in the, the flaccid state. During an erection, you're going to find that you have increased arterial flow and you have decreased venous flow, right? So you're kind of shutting off the outlet and kind of increasing the amount flowing in, right? So it's kind of like when you think about the, the glomerulus, we have more ACE inhibitor action and more prostaglandin action to try to increase the amount of flow there, right? So the GFR, so to speak, is going up in this case. So the ways that occurs, and it's important to focus on these secondary messengers and whatnot, because this is where our drugs are going to be playing a role here, is that to get the arterial flow up, we're going to be using things like cyclic AMP, or cyclic GMP in this case here, cyclic AMP, and vasoactive intestinal 
polypeptide. All these things are going to be helping to increase the acetylcholine mediated vasodilation, right? So acetylcholine is going to be working to help to increase uh, the, the arterial flow in of blood, okay? Um, then we're going to have things like nitric oxide, which will be stimulated in the endothelial cells. And, this, and we mentioned that nitric oxide normally does what to that smooth muscle? It can cause relaxation, right? So by relaxing, you're allowing more blood to flow in in those cases, right? And this is going to be a main uh, site for some of our drugs kind of focusing on this, okay? Um, other things like acetylcholine, obviously, are going to enhance cyclic AMP that helps with this vasodilation. And then we'll talk about prostaglandins as well. Prostaglandins are going to be playing a big role here. Normally, we found that those are vasodilatory as well. Um, this is going to play a role with one of our other alternative agents to some of the main ones. So... Um, the actual initiation of the uh, the erection itself, there needs to be some sort of psych uh, psychogenic stimuli. This is why if you were to have, say, for instance, a, a spinal cord injury that were to sever these connections here, you can have the stimulation from the CNS, but it never really makes it down uh, to the organ uh, of interest there to actually degenerate the erection itself. Um, and this is where a lot of drugs can be coming in uh, to playing a role here, right? So you can have things like um, dopamine exerts a pro-erectogenic effect. Well, if I'm blocking dopamine, you're going to find there's lots of issues with that, right? Um, things like alpha-2 stimulates, uh, stimulation inhibits erection. Well, what drugs do we saw that stimulates alpha-2? Remember clonidine? Remember guanfacine, right? Things we're using for hypertension. And a lot of that antihypertensives, guess what? They cause erectile dysfunction, right? So again, you're starting to see where a lot of these drugs are playing a role here. Like, yeah, we're fixing your blood pressure. We're going to keep you alive for longer. But they're like, I can't have sex now. Like, what's the point of living? So again, <laughs> oftentimes you're balancing these things out, right? And this is where some of our medications are going to be playing a role with this. Now, the act of detumescence is going to be mediated through norepinephrine. Basically, what this is going to do, norepi, typically is going to be vasoconstrictive. It's going to be causing those alpha receptors to activate, and that will then decrease that arterial flow in, and that will cause detumescence, right? So what do you call it when you have a, an erection that does not subside on its own? Priapism. How do we treat that? Anyone know? You could drain it, or we could actually give something called phenylephrine. We can actually inject phenylephrine to cause that vasoconstriction. It does the same thing as norepi does right here. Okay. Um, so again, we'll talk about that a little bit later on uh, as far as complications go for some of these medications here. But um, testosterone plays a big role here as well. So again, testosterone that uh, typically starts to decrease after age 40 or so. And then also you can have things like 5-alpha reductase plays a big role here because we mentioned that what is more active, more potent than testosterone? dihydrotestosterone. So we have this 5-alpha reductase that converts that over. If you have decreased activity of that, you're going to find you have less DHT. You may have erectile dysfunction that manifests from that. However, it's going to be playing a big role when we talk about effects on the prostate. Testosterone and DHT both cause prostate to grow, and that could lead to BPH, could lead to Prostate cancer. Prostate cancer, right, exactly. So these are things we're all going to be looking at. Um, now, we know a small amount of it gets converted over to estradiol. It's where we get some gynecomastia. It's where we can see that, um, again, we can see some of these kind of feminizing sort of effects here. And so when you're evaluating these patients, and I'm not going to go over a ton of stuff on testosterone here, but just know that it needs to be normal. Sometimes free levels and things like that can kind of help you out. But be aware, is it an issue of decreased libido, or is it a factor of the actual erectile dysfunction? They want to have sex, but they can't actually de develop the erection to do so. Um, those are the things you kind of want to be able to delineate out. So again, that's going to be determined based on the history and just talking to the patient. So looking at several causes for the pathophysiology here, you know, you have vascular issues, PVD, arteriosclerosis, all can impair blood flow, um, things like, you know, neurologic issues, things like spinal cord injury, stroke. Why do you think diabetes is listed here? It's the neuropathies that occur there, right? So by damaging the, the actual nerves themselves, you may not be able to stimulate that signal from the CNS on down, right? So again, that's one of the big things you can see with that. Obviously, hormonal issues we talked about. Um, have just an organic erectile dysfunction. That's usually kind of the most common cause. It's just kind of idiopathic. It just kind of occurs uh, with time there. And then when I say psychogenic, what do you think this means? Anxiety. Could be anxiety. Could be seen as depression, right? So imagine someone who like drinks too much alcohol when they're out on date night and all of a sudden they can't develop an erection. A lot of that is just due to that blunted sort of CNS aspects of it. Um, and a lot of times it could be multifactorial, right? So you want to kind of parse out to see like, okay, what are the different issues here and see which ones you can actually uh, target. Is it too much dopamine or too less depression? Usually in these cases with, um, if you were to have say, for instance, like a, a patient with um, schizophrenia, usually you're blocking dopamine and that's what can lead to it, right? Yeah, so not enough dopamine in these cases there. Now, of course, the patient needs to be in a receptive sort of state of mind here, the proper uh, uh, your frame of mind. So you need to, uh, you know, in some cases you have things like reactive depression, you have things like anxiety are playing a role here. Alzheimer's disease can be playing a role here as well. Again, um, uh, hypothyroidism, mental disorder, a lot of things that can factor into this, right? That these meds we're talking about for erectile dysfunction aren't really gonna be able to address. Now, medications cause a, a big number of cases of erectile dysfunction, as we already alluded to. So we said acetylcholine helps to stimulate that arterial flow 
well, what happens if I have an anticholinergic on board? Things like antihistamines, anti-Parkinsonian drugs, um, all these potentially can cause erectile dysfunction, right? So again, um, sometimes using things like second generation agents can kind of get around this to some degree. So if you need to use you a patient with seasonal allergies and diphenhydramine was causing them to have issues, um, you know, switch them over to something like what? Zyrtec, Claritin, Allegra, right? So what are the generics? Uh, <laughs> Cetirazine, Plexafinidine, <laughs> Loratadine. Uh, yep, remember. Because again, what's going to be on pants? Generics only, right? I'm giving you the benefit of the brain names because I want you to be able to kind of recognize these drugs as both because that's what you're going to find. People say Zyrtec, people say Allegra, but on the pants. Remember, you need to look at the generics, right? Um, and as I mentioned, a lot of the uh, drugs that we use for depression have anticholinergic activity. So things like we talk about next semester, tricyclic antidepressants, things like SSRIs can have some, uh, some all amount of activity here. The big thing, though, is we're going to focus on when we get to talking about that uh, to um, depression, bupropion actually has the least amount of sexual dysfunction. So this is actually a really good drug for patients who have, um, you know, still actually having sex, they have depression. Um, this can actually help with that because that's the least amount of sexual dysfunction associated with it. Anyway, um, dopamine antagonists, as I mentioned, so things like metoclopramide, which we talked about today, uh, phenothiazines, these are a lot of your antipsychotic drugs. We will cover this when we get into the behavioral section next semester. So just kind of keep it in the back of your mind. So uh, things like Estrogens, things like anti-androgens, anything kind of decreasing the activity of testosterone can also lead to this. You know, why do I mention spironolactone here? Uh, it's aldosterone antagonist, but what does it do to the testosterone receptor? It's a partial agonist, right? So again, you may have decreased overall testosterone activity because I'm only partially agonizing that receptor there, right? I mean, that's why we saw the gynecomastia you see with spironolactone. And then obviously CNS depressants are a big one, right? So benzodiazepines, which help to uh, depress the mental status. Opioids, large amounts of ethanol, anticonvulsants, things like that, all can be uh, playing a big role here because you may have the stimuli, the outside stimuli to stimulate an erection, but if the brain's not really able to process it, um, you're gonna find that it's not gonna really do much for you. How does the ketoconazole do that? Um, ketoconazole can have some, uh, some, some small anti-androgen sort of activity there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not a big effect, but something uh, sometimes pops up. Um, other things, so again, agents that can decrease the actual blood flow are going to be a lot of your antihypertensives, right? So diuretics can do this, beta antagonists, all these sorts of things. Um, basically, they're reducing that arterial flow here, okay? You see this less with things like ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and calcium channel blockers. So potentially, these may be good agents. So if a patient cannot tolerate a beta blocker, they say, you know, this erectile dysfunction is just too much for me. I just can't deal with this. Switch them over to the calcium channel block. Maybe that's a better option for those patients there, right? And then some miscellaneous agents, things like lithium, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and fibrozole. There's a lot of different ones that can potentially cause this. And if you think back to talking about those clinical trials, anything that gets reported there can get reported as an adverse effect. So some of these things may or may not be really that well associated with it, but just things to kind of consider. Just uh, the big thing to note is when you have a patient comes in with this complaint, look back at the medication list. See if there's any kind of smoking guns there that are really causing a big problem. They may be able to fix that. Instead of adding on more drugs, you can maybe switch them to a different drug, right? Okay, so as I mentioned, diagnosis mostly through the history, look at the medication list, look at their other uh, exam, uh, their the disease states, testosterone levels, all that can be really helpful in playing a role in deciding, okay, well, what's going to be the best course for this patient here? So um, let's go ahead and stop it here. And then we kind of got the path of phys out of the way. We'll come back next week and then kind of finish up with the actual, um, how we treat it, all that sort of thing. We'll uh, go over incontinence and all of that, and I'll kind of wrap up the section. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time left. We'll do a little bit of a review. Yes, ma'am. Are you going to give us like a study guide or wait, yours is not. Mine's not comprehensive, right? Oh. So this is only, and it's a good point. Thank you for reminding me. So our last test is going to go through the anticoagulants because remember last time we finished up through the antiplatelet drugs. It's going to be anticoagulants through the rest of that part three of cardio, part four of cardio, GI, GI and then the renal okay. urology stuff. Okay. And again, I got to rejigger the test so that way it actually contains everything that we covered. Um, but it will be representative of there. I'll try to make sure the percentages kind of work out to, to everything's kind of equal for the most part. Um, let me check the the.